Welcome to the Crania Creativity Workshop Series, part of the Crania Project at Dublin City University. In this first workshop in the series, we're joined by Peter Robbins from the Business School at DCU. Peter leads us on a lively and engaging introduction to the topic of creativity and sets us a few tasks to get us thinking. The workshop is introduced by Kieran Dunn. Um, many of you may know Dr. Peter Robbins. So Peter is, um, has very kindly agreed to deliver our first, to facilitate our first uh, workshop. He's based in the Business School at Dublin City University. Peter has vast experience from both the, the, the public and the private sector. He's a particular expert in the area of uh, design thinking. He's spent time in many countries around the world working on that and has also attended the D School over in uh, Stanford, which is the leading in the home of, of design thinking. And uh, I love working with Peter. He is such uh, a dynamic and engaging uh, and amicable uh, individual and expert. And um, I'm going to hand over to him because the rain is going to come through my, I'm not sure if you can hear that rain so loud. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Peter, thanks a million for being here today. And I shall hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, sorry, that seemed to. Um, yeah, now, sorry, I first, my apology is I suppose that my name doesn't seem to be too difficult to pronounce, and you get a bit tired of listening to 15 minutes of them telling you who's coming next rather than who you're, who you're going to be dealing with today. But yeah, I'm delighted to be the inaugural speaker. Um, and my experience, as Karen says, is has been largely about um, teaching innovation and coaching creativity in the sort of hard-boiled boardroom business types. So it's a great pleasure to be here talking to such nice, um, well-disposed people to creativity. Um, my expertise is in design thinking. And in a way, when I'm talking to them the, in, in the business world, it always seems to come as a surprise to people that in the area of, of pedagogy or in Bloom's taxonomy, when they revised it in the late 80s, creativity came at the very top. Uh, so there is no higher order work. I mean, as I say, and I like to say to some of my master's classes, there's only one Mozart and there's only one Seamus Heaney and there's only one direction. And we're, we're going to be working today um, in, you know, in doing creative work. And it's the most challenging and the most fulfilling type of work, but it can feel uncomfortable. But it, all innovation um, starts with creativity and all creativity begins with ideas. And the area that I'm particularly familiar with um, is the notion that uh, the way designers work to solve and produce solutions or possibilities for ill-defined ill problems can be of great service to, uh, to innovation. And it, certainly in the business area, um, we work through a couple of, we generate ideas and ideally um, what an organization is, is looking to do is to find higher ground, to be able to generate a palette of creative, original, novel, high potential ideas and have ideas that nobody else has. So I've given this talk a couple of times and I think it's possibly because um, I'm, uh, it's free that I seem to be in terrific demand. Uh, the last time was, the, uh, was International Women's Day. And so I've refined a kind of an agenda that we'll talk through today about wicked problems about the sad reality that um, our innate creativity seems to decline with age. And I'm gonna look at the couple of dimensions of creativity and I'm gonna test you on a couple of them. So let's get straight into it. Creativity, you know, in the, in the arts, it's a multi-dimensional um, multi thing. Pioneers of the field uh, suggested that creativity is a multifaceted phenomenon. And it just means that somebody can be very creative in one domain while showing no creativity whatsoever in other domains. 
But in our space, it's interesting that people who, who go into organizations and are creative and generate novel ideas, they basically get paid more and get promoted faster. Um, but I just wanted to talk for a moment about the process. Um, this fellow, Graham Wallace, uh, English social psychologist and London School of Economics co-founder, Graham Wallace, was 68 when he penned the book, The Art of Thought, which is a theory outlining the four stages of the creative process. And it's interesting for you know all of you, all of us will have been through the creative process. And these are the four phases, and they've been kind of either intensified or amplified, but not contradicted through uh, uh, subsequent research. The first bit is sort of figuring out, doing the preparation of gathering knowledge and dwelling in, if there's a, in some of these things, if there's a problem space and a solution space, the first phase is really trying to dimensionalize the problem. Then the next phase is that sort of subconscious phase where, where the subconscious takes over. And I'm sure, you know, that moment in the shower or asleep or when driving or doing something that's, that's not connected with the issue, that somehow often some kind of an epiphany arises, an inspiration, a solution, a potential solution. And then the final phase is the validation of that solution. And as I mentioned, um, generally, there are two types of thinking, but convergent thinking is the type of thinking that we see from uh, Poirot or uh, any murder mystery thing where every problem, despite the complexity, has only one single correct solution. And it employs logic and knowledge and familiar verified techniques to find that solution. But divergent thinking is the potential to be creative, the ability to see relationships among things and in, in unconventional ways and to produce multiple similar ideas. Also in the creative space, there's a kind of a um, big C creativity, the kind of clear cut genius level creativity that's reserved for the eminent and the great. On the other hand, little C creativity refers to the everyday common or garden variety that may not, that's found in most people, the kind of creativity um, that's more ambiguous and less remarkable. One test of whether something is big or little c is whether it materially changes the, the domain in which you're working. Um, so we're talking here about moving into the space of, of wicked problems. And uh, this is a term that is um, inseparable from design thinking. Design thinking was created to solve wicked problems. And if it's not a familiar term, then let me explain. Many of you probably completed the Irish Times crossword this morning, but if you have a thesaurus and a dictionary and a working knowledge of the language, you'd be able to figure this out. Um, but importantly, it has a stopping rule. You know when you've completed the crossword. The Rubik's Cube is a little bit more complicated, but it is an al algorithm and it also has a stopping rule. But let's get to something a little bit more complicated. The Gulf War has been the subject of a lot of study and analysis. Um, Dick Cheney, the then Secretary of State for Defense, took a lot of uh, advice from an airman called John Cole, and they had a strategy and the strategy worked. It was a complicated problem, but with a single goal. Afterwards, though, winning the peace was another matter, and it's a far more complex problem as it encompasses human emotion, loyalty, tribal issues, history, family, tradition, institutions, religion. This is a complex problem. Closer to home, a game of no two games of Monopoly are the same. You have human actors, a set of rules, and random interventions, but they still don't really qualify as wicked problems because a wicked problem is the sort of problem that not only can nobody, people not figure out the answer, but for, in most cases, unless you're a taxi driver or a hairdresser, you can't really uh, determine what the problem actually is. And there are a series of uh, elements of a, a wicked problem, but every solution that you, if for instance, you choose uh, traffic or the drug problem as a wicked problem, every solution alters the problem and you, the problem becomes different as a consequence. So the sort of wicked problems we're seeing the whole time in society and business is that are they problems of globalization, of politics, of poverty? Um, the drug problem is a wicked problem. 
zero tolerance doesn't seem to have worked and legalizing soft drugs doesn't seem to be a panacea either. And business is becoming a wicked problem. Simple things like food waste are increasingly wicked problems, but I suppose the most wicked problem we've seen uh, in anybody's lifetime is, is COVID. So there's no, this is where creativity comes in. There's no silver bullet um, to solve a wicked problem. There is no single silver bullet to solve this. It requires a different type of thinking. Um, it requires this type of thinking. Well, all these types of thinking. And um, Herbert Simon is widely acknowledged as the, um, the father of design thinking, a double Nobel Prize winner. But essentially, he simplified it to a great extent to say that design thinking is taking an existing set of conditions and improving them into preferred ones. So if you've ever done a big uh, home renovation, uh, like rearranging your sock drawer, for instance, then that's design thinking. It's taking an existing set of conditions and changing them into preferred ones. Um, soon, maybe in, in uh, June, you may be able to do something like this. But anybody who's ever planned a dinner party or rearranged their desk has engaged in design thinking. But now I want to, um, I want to give you a little bit of work to do. So um, we're going to sort of test your synapses see how quickly they're firing. I'm going to give you a five minute test um, and Kieran will arrange, he's got a lot of European funding, he's got to definitely arrange at least 10,000 euros or possibly more uh, for whoever can get this right. So I'm going to put up a series of 15 little sort of dingbat puzzles and um, I'm rather hoping people will have some, you know, those of you who've had a misspent um, adolescence and uh, adulthood at pub quizzes will be a, a significant advantage here. Um, but let me put the thing up that I'm gonna, there's a five minute timer on it. If you can do it in five minutes, um, you're gonna win our creativity award. So first of all, I can see a lot of people, or I can, I can look at the screen now, so I can see you now. Has anybody never done anything like this before? That is a few of you. Okay, very sheltered life um, you've had. So let me explain then. So Teresa, sorry, I'm looking at you and, and Audrey. Um, the idea here is that you just make some connections. You, you look at the, um, in each square, there's a discrete puzzle that needs to be solved. This one is, the answer to this is forgive and forget. So in each, each of them, there's some sort of aphorism or saying, and that one is forgive and forget. Let me give you, I'll give you another one. This one is just crossroads. Okay, so there's an intuitive logic to them. Uh, the only thing I would say, so there, you've got 15 of them. There are, most of them are um, pretty straightforward, but there is one really difficult one. So let me give you... Um, I'm going to put a little timer on and um, you've got to solve them. But just think of how enhanced your reputation will be in the university if you pull it off.
Now, you may not need the full five minutes. If you've, if you've managed to figure it all out beforehand, just let me know. I've seen it before and I still can't get them all. There is one killer one in there. They're all killers, Peter. <laughs> Tracy, you'll be hooked. You'll be, you know, doing these over the long weekend. Uh, Just took a photograph of my long weekend homework. The most fun of this is, is I suppose, I get to do what they do either on, on the Bake Off or the Portrait Painter of the Year. I get to say, you have one minute left. <laughs> and step away from your easels now in a minute. Has anybody got them? No. Got about three. 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 I thought, now this is the Mensa monthly meeting, isn't it? That was, oh. Hey, 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 hey. Um, okay, well look, perhaps, Who's got uh, 10? Leanne, well done, well done. Um, do you want to just... I think I have about 12 of them, I think. 12 or 13. Oh, run through what you've got, run through what you've got. Okay. Um, the first one is three degrees below zero. Excellent. And there's the forgive and forget one that you mentioned. I didn't get the third one. Um, that That's the killer one. Um, the next one is Crossroads. The fourth one is Broken Promise. Yeah. Uh, Jack in a Box. Yeah. One in a Million. Yes, One in a Million, yeah. This one I wasn't sure, is it Life After 40? <laughs> Life Begins at 40. Life Begins at 40, there you go. Um, the next one is Neon Lights. Yes, exactly. Uh, an Inside Job. Yeah. Um, I hadn't got the Struggle one yet, or Jumbo. An uphill struggle. Uphill struggle. Jesus. 
Let me say uh, white, <laughs> white elephant. White. Oh, okay. Wouldn't have gotten that one. Uh, afternoon tea. Yeah. Hole in one. Yes, exactly. And too little, too late. Too little, too late. Yeah. Um, did anyone get the one with Roberts? Um, I thought it was an OBE. Yeah, no, you're right, Audrey. That's the, the clue. OBE is, mm. you know, part of the British honor system. Mm. So it's actually honor among thieves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, a, that's the hardest one. Um, <laughs> there, hang on, hang on. Uh, oh. oh. No. <laughs> this is just to keep you all on your toes. Now, hold on. now um, let me sort of move on. Hold on. Uh, anyway, I thought I'd give you a bit of soothing music. Now, um, you're all still there, anyway. I wanted to share this great little um, insightful piece uh, from the 70s around um, the pressure we all feel to conform. So have a little look. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with a white shirt, the lady with a trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use... Let's see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? What? So uh, it's interesting, I suppose, sorry, the, the pressure that everybody feels to conform seems to increase with age. And one of the um, surveys that the late Ken Robinson used to quote was this idea of um, genius level creativity, which I'll, I will dis I'll discuss in a minute, um, how it declines with age. So that at three to five years when people, you know, it's free play and there aren't times to, for sport and times for poetry and stuff like that people have a high level of uh, creativity. But then when they get to eight to 12, it's all Ugg boots and uh, or eight to 10, Ugg boots and fake tan and um, school tends to, you know, queuing the Lena, all that kind of stuff tends to, um, to make the creativity, the natural creativity, raw creativity dissipate. But then when they get to around 15 or so, 
um, you know, they start reading uh, Catcher in the Rye and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, that kind of thing, and get a few tattoos and piercings. I was married that age myself and running a business. Um, you'd think that they might, it might be a bit of a kickback, but in fact, um, the creativity dwindles even more. Now, for some of you, then the next over 25 is something that you're, you'll experience in the next few years. Uh, creativity dwindles even more after that. So we're probably lucky that we have a group of outliers on the uh, call here today. But it's interesting, sorry, for um, in the work that I do often with businesses and executives, etc. This is true in general. And then in banks or places where there's a very strong machine bureaucracy, it's even more true. And then suddenly uh, they, the strategy is about innovation and they want to light the touch paper. And yet they've spent three decades beating the creativity out of people. So let's just see what, like, what's in there. Um, I can see, I, I do want you guys to do a bit of creativity. So one of the things we do, uh, but I won't ask you to do this just yet. I'll, I'll, uh, you know, when you get people to imagine a bicycle and uh, um, somebody cycling it, uh, an animal cycling it, and that the animal is so big that it dwarfs the, um, the bike and then when they're in bright, vivid colors, then you ask people to draw it and they always you know, see, hear this really uh, deep and sigh intake of breath and people generally draw kind of pretty much the same thing um usually an elephant on a bike um and then we get into the discussion of, of what's in creativity the components and um most research shows that there are there are four components the first bit is fluency which is essentially just your capacity to come up with a high number of ideas maybe we will do this one um, yeah, sorry. The ability to generate a high number of ideas. So may I ask um, that you all have a piece of, a blank piece of paper in front of you and a pen. And I'm gonna set a clock for um, 60 seconds. And I'm going to re reveal a slide in a moment. That is if you're still not looking at a blank screen, which I rather hope you're not. And I apologize for that at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna reveal a slide that has three images on it. And I'd like you to choose one of those images and to write out as many ideas as you can think of connected with that image. So there will be three and you're to choose one and um, just write down as many ideas as you can think of in, a, uh, in one minute. So if I just set this thing up. Um, so is, does that seem clear? Okay, well, if you're ready, you're gonna have one minute, you pick w just one of these things and come up with as many ideas as you can. See somebody's onto their second page. Okay, ten seconds. Okay, so um can I just ask then, uh, who has 10? Patricia, I should have guessed it. Well done. Um, do, would you mind sharing them with us? No problem, but they're quite silly. Like I just kept writing things. So I picked the brick 
um, and and it, it's just association. So I'm not quite sure if that's what you were looking for. Um, uh, so it's house barbecue, karate, uh, geography, sediment, garden center, uh, drum chandra, um, uh, speckled, uh, clay, baked, kiln, heat, uh, porous, uh, chalky, ruddy, red, and then I've got a whole load more as well. So they're just associations uh, with it. So I'm not sure if I did that right. I'm afraid you're going to be fired at the end of this um, session. Um, no, that was that's lovely. A whole list. Of, well, um, I was sort of looking for applications, but in that that list of yours of the the fire and the barbecue and the karate stuff, uh, most of them are applications. Were you thinking of breaking over drum chandra, or what? What did you got in mind there? Well, it's just drum chandra is so red brick. Well, it's actually orange brick, really. Um, uh, you know, with the all of the buildings, a lot of the buildings around the drum chandra area are made of that brick. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, okay, well, look, thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Generally, what happens is um, people get three to five. The top end is sort of seven to ten. And often the um, the way that it works is the, the last ideas, the ones that should be last on your list, are the most ex extreme, radical, different. The low hanging fruit comes early, and then when the you know the, when your time is running out. Now, if we had a bit more time, I'd ask you to do that uh, exercise in groups, because invariably in groups you get more ideas and you get more diversity in the ideas. But let's just move on. Um, the second component is the capacity to develop different a range of different ideas across different realms or spheres or domains or discipline areas. So, for instance. And I'm not, I won't ask you to do this, but if I'd said to you, how many things can you do with a wheel? And imagine you came back and said, there's a, a supermarket trolley wheel, a tricycle wheel, a bicycle wheel, a motorbike wheel, a car wheel, a train wheel, a bus wheel. Um, that wouldn't show any great flexibility of thought. That would just show the fluency. If you said, for instance, um, windmills or the wheels of your mind or the wheels of industry or that kind of thing, then you're showing um, a great deal of, of flexibility. The third piece is originality. And that's quite a difficult one um, because generally the measure of it is if we have a thousand people and we ask them uh, something, if we ask them this, uh, how many uses can you suggest for a key? It's the answer that appears most rarely in those lists. So it's whatever it's the, it, the measure of it is if you if it's unique to you, then it's highly original. But the last measure is the one I really want to get to, because, say, for instance, um, you know, we can all generate uh, ideas. But if somebody then says, well, tell me more about that. Um, the way you were very well able to there, Patricia, tell, say more about uh, drum chandra, but it's the capacity to make your ideas vivid and more elaborate quickly. So um, this is a very useful part of creativity, and it's the part where we bring in a little bit of creative writing. So um, that's the bit that um, I'd like us to do now. And um, I'm going to give you 15 minutes and then we'll finish, but I'm going to uh, and the next slide is, um, or maybe I'll just, sorry, I'll just give you 10 minutes. And the next slide is a series of two characters, uh, an emotion and a setting. And I want you to write the next big Netflix hit. I want you to write the opening scene of a blockbuster, no holes barred, full on high adrenaline, you know, 100 miles an hour thriller and i'm going to give you 10 minutes to do it so you've got to pick two characters an emotion and a setting and create something powerful so i'm going to give you 10 minutes from now and we'll we'll read a couple and um reflect
got four minutes left. Okay, you got two minutes left. Okay, so I'm afraid we have to be very finely calibrated here um, to finish on time. But um, one of the things sort of interesting, I think is um, that in business or in uh, work life, our capacity to use language um, in a vivid way or that to, to explore a, a richer vocabulary is somewhat constrained and in, certainly in business where they are always looking for lean and operational excellence and uh, higher levels of efficiency, any redundant verbiage in communication is rather frowned upon. Um, and therefore, um, sometimes working with organizations, they, we bring in a writing coach and in the, uh, in the UK, there's a company called The Writer. And this guy used to, say that the writing should be precise, concise, and vivid. And um, the vivid element we just very, very rarely see, I think, in, in communication. So people seem to enjoy doing it. Then I got a guy in the US to give the same talk to a group. And uh, in America, their head of professor of journalism was basically saying, it should be right, bright, and tight. Um, so anyway, generally people really enjoy doing a little bit of creative writing, but I'd love before we finish, if we could um, share one or maybe two even, but uh, is there anybody willing to read out uh, what they came up with?
I'll read mine, Peter, if you get nobody else, but it's not very well written. Will I start by telling you what characters I took? Well, that would probably emerge in the... Um, in the oh, yeah, OK. Oh, yeah. Well, then I'm not going to say anything. That would be great. Thanks, William. And then I'll ask Eimear. I think Eimear... Thank you, Eimear. Are Thanks, Rita. Really yeah. OK, so he stood in the dock of the bleak courtroom. He held his head high as though he had nothing to hide, but he had. Beside him, his lawyer leafed through a sheaf of documents. She looked anxious. What was she doing here, defending a man who had once occupied every moment of her life, filled every thought and for whom she would have done anything? Today, he was in court for fraud. She was going to defend him. But how do you defend somebody who betrayed you? Do you help him to win his case or do you hang him out to dry? And then it goes back. Um, that one was, sorry, was February 2020. And then we go back to December 2008. Amanda walked into the cafe. The place was full. As she took her coffee and croissant, there were no free tables. She saw an empty chair beside a smartly dressed man. He looked safe. She nodded as if to say, mind if I sit here? He looked up and she was mesmerised by his eyes. She was a young law student. And then you have to tell the rest. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. Sorry, I mean, because I actually cheated there. You didn't really get even get the 10 minutes. Um, you got about eight. And you must have had half of that written before you came in, Teresa. Did you let me be a novel? I knew Emer wanted to read, so I had to leave her a bit of space. So you can tell I chose the lawyer, the lawyer, the accountant. Well, it, in my case, it was the accountant. The emotion was revenge, and the setting, as you all now know, was the the courtroom. And were you going to let her um, hang out to dry, or was she going to defend him? Do you think? And oh, she was totally going. It's revenge. Nothing but revenge, revenge Peter. <laughs> Okay, that was brilliant, Teresa. Thanks, William. Well, I will go to Emer then next. Thanks again, Teresa. Hi, Emer. Hello, everybody. Um, so, um, right, my characters will emerge, etc. Little did Edwina know that her life was about to change when she walked across the tarmac to the tw small 12 seat plane going to Donegal. Little did she know that the man walking ahead of her was the pilot using a white stick. In she got, sat in seat 5A and watched white stick man walking to seat 1A, but no, further into the cockpit. She was horrified. Jeter Shinnegs and Polk, Kajishin at her shoe and shop. Nobody else seemed perturbed. She assumed it was a prank, a cruel one in one way, but hilarious in another. She settled down to eat her croissant and wait for coffee to be served. It wasn't coffee, it was a nasogastric tube choking her. The lights were bright very bright. There was a lot of clear clicking and whirring. Somebody was holding her hand. She managed to look across to the next gurney. There he was, without his white stick, holding her hand tenderly, saying, I fell for you. We all fell. I leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. Um, beautifully written, Emer. Um, <laughs> Fabulous. It's great. It's um, They're both of them sort of rich in imagery and everything, aren't they? You, you evoke the situation with such, um, so simply and so accurately, um, so professionally, so adroitly. Have we time for, for it's just 8 and 11. Have we time for one more? Or is there anybody else who... Tim, you might have one there, do you? Did you, did you do it this time? I don't, want to, I don't want to say it, Tim. I don't want to say it to you, but you're on mute. I'm Sorry, um, my my one from this time round was nowhere near as good as those two, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cheat and pull out the one from from uh, from earlier and, re <laughs> and rehash from last time round. So no, I'll, I'll keep quiet this time. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm happy one... to share if it's okay. Michael's my name. It's yeah. It's hi, not... Michael. Thanks, million. No worries. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's just a list of sentences, but um, anyway. Police officer spots car speeding. Officer chases car and demands the driver pulls over. Driver explains that he is a pilot and he's late for takeoff. Police officer proceeds to issue the ticket. Pilot pleads that passengers are waiting and he fears the ticket would reflect badly on his record. Police officer, while sympathetic, issues the tickets anyway and says he has no choice. Uh, time passes by. Police officer is at the airport for holidays. Mm -hmm. He's afraid about flying. He has to take a smoke. He runs to the terminal. Boarding is over. He pleads his case with the pilot. Pilot, while sympathetic, flies away, explaining that he has no choice because he was late due to be stopped due to be 
to being stopped by the police officer and he's afraid it might reflect back badly on his record if he's late, yeah. Excellent, excellent. A certain sort of karma, karmic um, symmetry about that. Thanks a million, Michael. Thanks a million. No worries. Okay, if we had, um, if I hadn't sort of messed up with the slides, I would have asked, got you to do a little bit of sort of visual stuff. It's quite a nice, um, if you have a sort of a long, a very long day or half day with uh, students that, where creativity is helpful, uh, this, these ones are, you know, where you get them to take random objects and uh, create something. Um, the, the students can be extraordinarily creative with these things. Um, so, but I am um, due to finish at 11 a.m. and therefore I feel um, the least I can do is release you to, um, to the rest of your day. And thank you yeah. so much for your um, kind attention. And sorry about the whole slide debacle now. Your recording, Tim, is going to be, um, well, it's going to be something of a collector's item. Yeah. Now, Peter, um, thanks a million. Honestly, it's always a pleasure um, when you facilitate any session and it's so it's so engaging. And, you know, it goes back to, I think, that the, the fundamental remit and rationale for our project is around fostering creativity. So creativity isn't something that is taught, but it is something that is cultivated, that is fostered, that can be promoted and stimulated. Um, and it's associated, I think, a bit with, you know, being uncomfortable and, you know, and putting yourself out there and, and the idea of risk and um, <clears throat> even the idea of what people might call failure, but it isn't failure. It's kind of like, you know, it, it's embracing this ambiguity. It's pre-success almost. Um, and so what we're trying to do all the time is create these conditions that allow people to explore their creative potential in a, in a safe and secure and rewarding and fulfilling way. Um, so Peter, thanks a million for that.